Thank you. I'm Ruth Meinzendick, and while I'm setting up my uh, presentation here, I'll, I'm um, president of the International Association for Study of the Commons, which has an organization that's been um, working for a number of years on these issues. Uh, we were formal, formerly focusing more on uh, natural resource commons, common property, and have now broadened out to include other forms of commons, including digital commons. So I'm really delighted to be here for this interaction interface, and I hope that uh, many of you, as well as those thousand other people who were interested in this, might come to continue the conversation in the, um, through the electronic platforms of the International Association for Study of the Commons, or through our next conference, which will be in, in Hyderabad, India, in January 2011. So that's, that's just an invitation for everyone to follow it up. I grew up on the commons. Although I may not look like it, I grew up in rural South India. Behind our house was a kardu, or forest, where the shepherds would graze their animals, and women would collect firewood and medicinal plants. Beyond that was an irrigation tank that supplied water for crops, fish, household needs, and recharged the groundwater. One of my greatest delights was always when my father would take me out through the tank or to watch the shepherds bring their flocks back to the lambs at night. I also remember what happened when pump set technology came in and rich farmers were able to put in deeper wells, pump more groundwater, effectively enclosing that common pool resource. And the drinking waters that we all, wells that we all depended on dried up and everybody had to keep investing in more and more in deepening our wells in a race to the bottom. Of course, at the time, I didn't really know that these were commons. I only came to appreciate the collective action that it takes to manage these resources when I went back to India to do my master's thesis fieldwork, studying a tank irrigation system near where I had grown up. Since that time, I've dedicated a lot of my uh, professional work to looking at resources that are in some way or another shared resources. Water, this is in Africa where uh, spring protection really helps communities access water. Forests, pastures, biodiversity, this is in the Andes where uh, in Peru where seven communities have pooled their land and grow over a thousand varieties of native potato. Even sports fields. The commons play a vital role in the livelihoods of billions of people. The uh, program I coordinate on collective action and property rights has laid out this framework for looking at any kind of resource or technology if it's got a long time scale, if people don't have property rights, they won't have the incentive to take care of it. They don't have rights over it in some way, a stake in it. And anything above the, the scale of an individual requires some form of coordination. Much of this, uh, whether they're resources or things that address climate change, are really commons, all those things in that, in that red circle up there. Over 1.6 billion people live in and actively use the 30% of the global land mass that's forest. Close to 1 billion people use the 40% of the land mass that's dry lands. These areas are often classified by national law as public lands, but in many places they're actively managed by their inhabitants, often through common property arrangements. Throughout history, many societies, these have been uh, treated as common property of some group, developing rules about who needs to contribute what and who can draw what from that resource. 
This is an irrigation system in Bali, a subak, for example. That's not to say that these systems are perfect. Common property has also been critiqued at least as far back as Aristotle. But Garrett Hardin's article, The Tragedy of the Commons, has been particularly influential because of the catchy name he used and the metaphor he used of saying that commons would become degraded. And um, the, the result has actually been a move to either privatize or nationalize the commons, taking it away from the communities that depend on and really know these resources intimately. We've now had over 40 years of research since Hardin's time that demonstrates that his, his analogy is catchy, but it's incorrect. There are many cases of commons that have been managed sustainably over long periods of time, centuries, even a thousand years in some of the cases. The International Association for Study of Commons, or IASC, and the Digital Library of the Commons have collected thousands of studies of commons. And Eleanor Ostrom, our founding president, won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for her work on governing the commons. There she is at our conference in Bali, looking at one of these subaks. She and others have clearly demonstrated that resource users around the world have, defi have defined rules and established norms for the regulation uh, and conservation of these shared resources. In short, Hardin got it wrong because he ignored the potential for communication and human ingenuity to develop and enforce rules, to build trust among people so that people would abide by these rules. Ostrom's famous design principles and other studies identify principles and some of the key elements that contribute to effective commons management, where enough people contribute and overuse is constrained. It's clear there are no blueprints. Effectively managing the commons requires adaptation to local conditions and active involvement by the users themselves, not rigid rules that are set by the outside. Resource overuse and degradation are not inevitable and largely associated with open access situations, often associated with, with nationalization, where people, the uh, local users' rights are constrained. There are also pressures like privatization, individualization, population increase, commercialization, migration that can undermine commons. The real tragedy of the commons is that they are so misunderstood, so undervalued. The commons are of particular importance for securing the livelihoods of, of poor or marginalized groups in society, including women and the landless. Although the value generated by the use and sale of these different products often don't go through the market so they're not counted, but uh, some studies that have tried to study this have shown that these values are really very substantial. In 1996, a study in India showed that the forests contributed, common property, community forests, contributed up to 29% of the income of the poorest groups, and total value was $5 billion that year. That was twice the value of foreign direct investment or twice the value of official development assistance to India that year. From India to Zimbabwe, we find that the poorest households especially depend on the commons and they provide a buffer in bad years. Unfortunately, bad years often happening more frequently now. Um, then there are the ecological benefits of the commons. Regulating water flows, maintaining biodiversity, sequestering carbon. These benefit not just the people who live on the commons or right next to them, but the downstream urban dwellers and all of us, no matter how far away from those commons we are. The interesting here, thing here is that attempts to take the commoners out of these commons, 
by making protected areas and keeping the people out have usually failed. People who live with these resources have special knowledge of their management and including them can lead to more resilient management of the resources than if they're pushed out. But the commons also fulfill social, religious, cultural, and recreational functions. My doctor father, Walt Coward, studied many irrigation systems. He found that that holding property in common is what he called the social glue, that creating the property and, and holding it in common was the social glue in those communities that facilitated cooperation in other areas as well. From the other side, I just read a study last week that showed in Kenya that uh, in Samburu pastoralist communities, where the group ranches had been privatized and individualized, the uh, communities, the, the, the odds of cooperating in communal farm labor are 93% lower for those households than for those that still held land in common. So that doesn't just affect the farm labor, but a whole range of other collective action for mutual benefit that communities depend on. That loss of social cohesion was not taken into account when the decision was made to privatize the group ranch. There may still be a question of whether commons is just a relic of the past or still has relevance today. I would argue that the commons are as relevant as ever and may be even more needed to address the problems today. Shared resources of biodiversity are being discussed in Japan, carbon and climate in Copenhagen and Cancun. The oceans are overpolluted and overfished. Cities and suburbs need parks, sidewalks, and trails to allow people to walk, bicycle, exercise, stay healthy. And we need the social interaction as well as the physical goods that this creates. The question is, how can those principles from local commons be taken to higher levels? Over 10 years ago, Eleanor Ostrom and others wrote about this, pointing out that these larger national, regional, and global challenges are harder to address through the commons because of problems of scaling up, cultural diversity, as you get more diverse groups interacting with each other, complications of interlinked resources, and accelerating rates of change. But there are certain principles that do apply. First is the need for people to recognize the salience, the importance to their own lives of these commons. And I think this conference helps to do that. And the second principle is that there's not one monolithic entity management unit, but nested enterprises, the polycentric governance that we will be talking about tomorrow. A third principle is that allowing people who depend on the resource scope to make decisions. I would add a fourth principle that we need to tap into ideology as a motivation that goes beyond narrow self-interest. Unfortunately, Garrett Hardin is still taught in a very uncritical fashion in a lot of places. I would say that I become, became hooked on the I ask meetings at the second one I attended in Norway that Erling organized when Douglas North, who had just won the Nobel Prize that year, gave the keynote and he said, rational self-maximizing behavior that we're taught in Economics 101, we all know that's nonsense, don't we? I wanted to stand up and cheer. <laughs> there are things that motivate people to work beyond for their collective interests beyond themselves we just need to understand how to tap into it and i think we should also understand that it isn't going to necessarily happen automatically but there are certain new developments that are promising for the commons technologies that allow us to monitor the resource technologies like ICTs that Michelle and others will be talking about that allow us to communicate and get to know people at a distance, even when we may not meet in person and develop bonds of trust. Also, communities don't have to do it alone. Governments can play a role in facilitating this cooperation. 
partly by recognizing the rights of communities to govern resources, make decisions, and benefit from the investments they make together. Let me give you an encouraging example of how the commons have been strengthened. The English commons are almost synonymous with enclosure movement that happened in history when the landlords evicted villagers from the commons to convert them for, for their private use. In recent years, both urban and rural people in England have recognized the importance of the village commons, not just for the people who graze their, their animals on them, but also for walking, biodiversity, uh, natural beauty and cultural heritage. The 2006 UK Commons Act strengthens the rights of commoners and provides an example to other uh, countries of how different groups can come together to protect the commons. Here's a group from Kyrgyzstan and Botswana who were uh, studying these English commons at, at our conference there. And now Kyrgyzstan has passed in 2009 a pasture act that gives stronger rights and decision-making authority to those commoners in, in uh, tapping into the cultural heritage of Kyrgyz commons. The uh, girl on the uh, right-hand side there is my daughter, who I also was able to take to this conference. The commons connects us across generations. I began by telling you about my father introducing me to the commons. Let me close with the next generation. I've been fortunate enough to take my children to the same tanks and car to, in India where I grew up. And I took my daughter to the IASC conference where she got to learn from Eleanor Ostrom and others about the con commons when she was still in high school. When she started at the university last year, her microeconomics professor was teaching the tragedy of the commons. She raised her hand and said, excuse me, but that's not inevitable. And he said, I think most economists would disagree with you. And she said, actually, the Nobel Committee would agree with me. They just awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics <laughs> to Eleanor Ostrom for her work on the commons. And he said, well, I suppose I should have said the tragedy of the open access commons. And she said, yes, you should have. <laughs> she still passed her class. <laughs> so, many of the things I've talked about here are complicated, and a lot of what we're going to talk about are complicated. So let me propose one simple thing today, that we move to correct university curricula and through that popular discourse. <laughs> Ostrom said that in a lot of universities, the average American student will, will be taught Garrett Hardin's article three times. They will be assigned to read it. <laughs> Instead of, of having that tragedy of the commons taught as a self-fulfilling prophecy, let's replace it with a strategy for the commons so that we can tap into the optimism of youth combined with a knowledge of the possibilities of collective action to trump cynicism and narrow self-interest in a really transformational paradigm of the commons. Thank you very much.